about being here is, especially with Evan, is because he is my lucid dreaming teacher. And I had never experienced a lucid dream until Evan showed me how to do it when we were all at a weekend retreat with friends. Gave me a little special, fully legal drug that you all will be receiving tonight at the end. Um, and like gave me the instructions on how to get into a lucid dream, the things that I should be watching out for and f not be fearing. And I, I do highly recommend him as uh, a lucid dreaming teacher who has helped me a lot. And I wish that I had more time with him so that I could, I could be able to get into those states more. So please, give it up. A super warm round of applause for Evan Stites. Hello, hello. How's it going, everyone? Thank you so much for coming out here. It means a lot to me to see so many people here to talk about dreams, the thing that usually when you bring it up with your roommate in the morning, they immediately start yawning because they don't want to hear about your dream. But this is the space where we can all talk about our dreams. We can talk about uh, what we want to dream and how we're going to dream it. So um, without further ado, I will start I'm going to go through um, what we're doing today. But first of all, I wanted to share this. Um, there is a hole in reality where the butterflies are hanging out. That's the last line of the last dream report that I wrote um, a couple nights ago. And I just wanted to share that. I, I really like to um, try to capture little poetic snippets from dreams. One of the things I get out of it the most. Um, but let's let's get into the plan. Okay, so um, the number one thing I would like everyone to come away from today with is the ability to lucid dream. So I truly believe that this is something that you can learn, and you can learn in in basically in one session. Um, there, obviously, it's going to take more time to actually build those skills um, to to experience it. But um, I think that the basic knowledge of how to do this is not very complicated, and I'm excited to share it with you over the next half hour or so. Um, then I'm going to talk a little bit about why. Why would we want a lucid dream? What is the point of lucid dreaming? And um, kind of why do I lucid dream? Why, you know, I'm curious why other people would want to lucid dream. Um, and then after that, um, so I actually... Uh, spent the past year doing a lot more research into lucid dreaming and um, I have some nuggets of wisdom, maybe not wisdom, data, let's say. I have some data that I want to impart that you might not find in a Google search result. And so the kind of ending of this presentation will just be a little bit of a data download of here's some cool facts about lucid dreaming, things that you might not have known, um, and I'd be happy to answer more questions about those things after that. So, um, who are we? Who am I? Who are you? Who, I, I will start by answering, I would like you all to start thinking about who you are. But now I'm going to tell you who I am. So my name is Evan. I'm a uh, ex-entrepreneur. Um, I left my startup company earlier this year to become a full-time dreamer. And um, since then, I've been doing a lot of lucid dreaming. But I've actually been doing lucid dreaming for about 11 years. Uh, I've taught hundreds of people how to lucid dream. And it's just something that I'm really passionate about because every time I bring it up in a conversation, it's that one thing that just seems to get everybody excited. I don't know what it is about it. Everyone wants to lucid dream. It's like they want to fly around the world or something. It's, not, it's like that might be fun. Um, so. That's kind of who I am, I guess. I, I'm doing this all um, non-profit, uh, even though I'm associated with several for-profit organizations. But I am, an, I am not getting anything out of this. The apps that I'm launching uh, that I'll tell you guys about at the end, also, it's just all kind of free. It's just this is really what I want to do. I want to help as many people get lucid as possible um, over the course of the next few years. Um, so OK. Let's start thinking about this. So everybody, please close your eyes. Take a couple of deep breaths. We're going to be answering a very profound question in a moment. A 
I'd like you to start thinking about who are you. And notice what kind of answers come to mind. What defines you? Or maybe there's, it's like an onion. You First you're thinking one thing and you peel it away and there's there's a little bit more under there. Try to Try to dig in there and get that little green middle onion piece that you can't eat. Okay, now that you've gotten into the really difficult part of who are you, I'm going to give three categories, and I want you to decide which one of these three categories you fit into. So you now just get to become one, two, or three. So one is you have never had a lucid dream before. Uh, you just know a tiny bit about lucid dreaming, and you're here completely uh, trying to learn about lucid dreaming for the first time. Number two is you've had some lucid dreams, but you haven't been able to consistently get lucid, and your reason for being here is that you'd like to learn more about how to more consistently enter the state. And then number three is that you are a consistent lucid dreamer, and you're here because you would like to learn more about how to stay in the dream and what to do when you're there. All right, so you can open up your eyes, and then if you're in group number one, uh, Complete newbie, please raise your hand. Okay. Now, if you're in group number two, please raise your hand. Great. How about group number three? Couple people? Okay, cool. So I just did that because I really wanted to calibrate this a little bit to who the audience is. And there's kind of a different set of things I would talk about if I was addressing more people who are, okay, I'm already lucid a lot. Now I want to take it to the next level versus you're just kind of learning how to get there more frequently. Um, now, we are going to go back into a pair exercise. So please look around and try to find somebody that is next to you that you can talk to. Or if not, that three people is also OK. And the, the question that I would like you to talk to each other about briefly here is, why are you here? Why are you at this event? Why do you want to learn about lucid dreaming? Why? You have a two or three minutes. What is lucid dreaming? OK, let's do that. Because I realize that I've been up here on the stage for a little bit. I've been talking about lucid dreaming, but without really explaining what lucid dreaming even is. So I apologize for that. But here we go. So what is lucid dreaming? Um, we all, I'm sure, are familiar with the concept of a dream. Um, when you go to sleep, your brain unleashes its creative fury on some uh, data that is, instead of being based on the physical world, the data that's in your head. And it creates all kinds of weird experiences and imagery and sort of like a movie. Um, and um, we can kind of get into this more later, but I sort of actually define waking reality as a subset of dreaming. Um, that's kind of confusing, because then you can't talk about, like, are you dreaming or are you awake? but um, that's sort of what lucid dreaming has led me to, this idea that actually this is also a dream. Um, it's just a dream based on physical data. And the dream that you have when you're asleep is based on some other data. What is that data? That's really the whole point of the dream, is to kind of convey that to you. Um, so lucid dreaming is different, because in a lucid dream, you're aware that you're dreaming. So in a, while in a normal dream, you would be kind of like, oh, there is a giant hippo. There's like my great-great-grandfather alive and well and 23 years old. Normal, right? And I, in a lucid dream, you, you recognize these things. That, oh, like a hippo. That, I don't see hippos. I'm probably dreaming. And then you're sort of going around like, this is cool. It's like I'm in the real world, except that it's actually a dream. Um, so maybe I have more possibilities than I would in waking life. Um, I also kind of see lucid dreaming as another way of t thinking about it would be it brings this self, the true self that is you, into the dream. Whereas in a normal dream, there's a separation between the self that you experience as having been in that dream and then who you are when you wake up. It's almost like there's two different people because you didn't really feel like you chose to you know, beat up your little brother for a toy last night. But 
in the dream that happened. And, and so there's this separation of selves. And so what happens with lucid dreaming is we're actually bringing the self that we associate with here into the dream. And it unlocks a lot of other kind of revelations about self, um, which is one of the reasons I'm asking you to think about who you are. Uh, okay, so does that explain lucid dreaming to people? Do you, is, do you want more detail on the what is lucid dreaming? Anybody? Not really? Okay. Uh, yes. Okay. Sure. Okay, so we have a question. Is lucid dreaming just knowing that you're dreaming or also being able to control what is happening in the dream? Uh, my definition of lucid dreaming is actually just about being aware that you're dreaming. You don't necessarily need to be able to control, but there's a sense of you have the kind of control that you have in waking life at sort of a minimum. Like, it may not be that I can decide that I suddenly want to be flying with triceratopses through tropical rainforest skies, but I can at least decide to take a step in a direction, which normally you can't really do. Or if you do it in a normal dream, you're not doing it from the same sort of path of, of motivation that your your core self. So anyway, um, let's keep going um, to what I always get. So I talk about lucid dreaming a lot. I've been doing this for 10 years, and I've had countless conversations with people. I like truly love it every single time. Um, but it is also true that I get asked the same questions a lot of times. So before you all come over to me and ask me these questions afterwards, let's just answer them right now. So, um, so first of all, people always ask me, um, oh, you're lucid dreaming, that's so cool, why? Like, uh, what, what do you get from it? What's the advantage? Even some, some have asked, is there a work productivity bo bo boost that you get? Uh, <laughs> so sometimes there can be, but anyway, um, what are the benefits of lucid dreaming? Uh, I think of it as mostly being about self-discovery, about, um, really being in these exciting, interesting situations, feeling present for it, uh, adding color to your life if you're, let's say, working all day every day and it's kind of boring, and then maybe you get to go on some epic adventure with Barack Obama as your sidekick or something. Like That's cool. It's just fun, and it's fun to feel like you're there. So one element of it is it's just fun. I also think that there's a creativity that comes from connecting with the dream state, and while there are a lot of benefits that you can get just from connecting with the dream state itself, lucid dreaming allows you to take it one step farther because you can ask for specific things, you can bring back specific memories, you can sort of intend like, oh, I really want to remember that question mark and somehow try to bring that back. Um, and so these are the kind of things that you can do with lucid dreaming um, that you can't just do with normal dreaming. Um, I also believe that lucid dreaming can make you more able to realize things in your regular everyday life. Because if you're able to dream it, then you can make it real. And it sort of reflects into reality. Um, but then number two is actually what are, what are the risks of lucid dreaming? Um, so lucid dreaming is not necessarily always all good. And it's definitely not always that you have all the control that you'd want to have. Sometimes it can be a little bit more like your present awareness is there, but you're kind of along for the ride, and the ride might take you someplace that is a little unexpected, maybe even unpleasant, maybe even extraordinarily unpleasant. And so it's just worth mentioning that um, I think that it can be uh, it open. It can open one up in a way that can sometimes also bring in a little fear, especially making you confront your fear. So that could be seen as a good thing, that could be seen as a scary thing, but it's definitely part of the experience. Um, do you still get rest when you lucid dream? A lot of people ask me, you know, oh, you're lucid dreaming, you must be so tired because you're like conscious all night. And actually when you lucid dream, it's pretty cool. You are conscious and then you wake up and you still feel rested as you would if you were getting regular dream sleep. But that being said, Usually lucid dreaming practice involves some amount of waking up and going back to sleep, and then there's some writing in your dream journal. And so overall, that time that you spend over the night gets eaten up a little bit. Like you're not gonna just be like solid eight hours through. It might end up being that you got five to six hours of sleep that night because you were doing lucid dreaming stuff. 
Um, you know, uh, can I lucid dream whenever I want? Yes, I can. Um, if I want to lucid dream on a certain, given certain constraints. Um, and I think that once I share with you the methodologies that I use, you'll understand that you can also achieve the same thing. Um, you can lucid dream when you want to, if you have the correct type of time and space. Uh, and I usually only lucid dream once or twice a week anyway. And so the question of whether it is interrupting my sleep schedule doesn't become super important. It's kind of just, um, it's more of like a weekly treat. It's not every single night lucid, because that would be a lot, you know, it would be kind of intense, to be honest. Okay. Uh, so, so lucid dreaming is everything you ever wanted to experience and a few things you really probably didn't. All given to you for the cheap price of messing with your sleep schedule a little bit and doing a few simple exercises that I'm going to show you in a second. But I do want to take a moment to pause here and do another little meditation, um, which I... Um, which I think would be fun. So I asked you earlier why you're here. So I'd like you all to now, with eyes closed, think about if you could dream about anything in the world, if you could have any experience, what would that be? What would you dream about? And try to really picture that dream. I almost try to dream it right now. Just stay in that dream for a couple more breaths and then open your eyes when you're ready. So now that you've thought about exactly what you would want to dream and you're thinking, maybe this is what I can accomplish through lucid dreaming. You probably can't quite dream that dream. But that's, that's not the point of lucid dreaming, actually. It, it, it will still be really fun. But what you're imagining right now, you can fantasize about that. I've also um, had people... Um, T talk about dream incubation practices. So if you do the exercise we just talked about before you go to sleep, you may actually dream about the thing that you're imagining because you're kind of training your brain to do it. Um, but I guess before we go on, just because I think it would be fun, do anybody want to share what they were going to dream about? I know this could could be embarrassing. Maybe not. I don't know. Um, all right, we got one in the back. What, what's your name? Alan, with shifting back and forth between life and death. Thank you for sharing that. Um, flying. Enough said. <laughs> yeah, flying is awesome. It's very fun and very possible to do in lucid dreams. That's definitely achievable. What about Dave? Dave wants to dance underwater. That sounds, that sounds achievable as well. Nice. People have reasonable dreams. Sierra? So Sierra is saying that she wants to have a dream in which the stresses of her everyday life are cleared. And she's able to dive into a crystal clear water that washes away every ounce of stress. And that is very, very possible with lucid dreaming. It's actually possible even just from taking a nap. But no, no, I'm, I'm not. I know that sounds like a joke, but I'm serious. And if you're lucid, it, it's really satisfying because you feel the transition from the moment when your mind is really clinging to the, the stress of physical reality. And it could even be as much as pain. Like you're feeling pain, you know, if you had an amputated limb or something and it's hurting. And then you fall asleep and you just feel how the tension of that is lifted. And that's something that 
um, actually happens naturally when we fall asleep, but it's great when you're lucid because you're present for it and you can feel how these stresses dissipate. It's like if you've ever been going through something difficult in your life and then you wake up in the morning and there's this brief little moment of like blissfulness in the bed before you remember what's fucked up shit is happening in your life and it's like, God damn it. But this is the opposite of that. This is like you go from, from that fucked up situation and then you, you wash as it gets washed away. Um, so I think that covers us in terms of what is lucid dreaming, some of the basics. We've talked about it. And now I want to move on to the real meat of this presentation, which is how do you lucid dream? Um, so let's, so, so I, I even wrote a little poem that I promise I'm going to explain because it's, it's kind of weird. So step one is the journal kept by your bed. Step two is keeping minders across time and head. Step three is the moment when you glitter and go bright and early around foe and the moan. <laughs> yes, it is true. It is only three steps, three steps, three simple steps to lucid dreaming. Um, and I'm going to explain what I mean by these funny things that I'm saying. Um, so basically, to simplify that, it's number one is dream journaling. Uh, dream journaling is the number one way to improve your dream recall. And dream recall is a prerequisite to lucid dreaming. So you won't be able to lucid dream if you're not dreaming. And dreaming basically is remembering your dreams. Um, to s number two is reality checks. These minders, these rem it's a, it has to be like a built-in alarm clock that sort of sounds in your own mind in certain situations to tell you to ask, am I awake right now or am I dreaming right now? Um, and then number three is actually lucid dreaming, which um, is, I think, the step that most people who don't lucid dream miss. Um, I don't mean that as a joke. I actually mean that there's a technique in the moment of, on the night of, on the 6.30 a.m. of when you actually lucid dream. And if you don't do that technique, it's hard to get lucid, no matter how much you do reality checks. And so I think a lot of, a lot of times, a lot of people I know who get stuck, they do number one and they do number two, but they never get to number three. Um, or maybe they're too lazy to do number three. I don't know. Uh, it does involve waking up very early. So, so let's talk about dream recall, um, starting with this sort of dream journal concept. And um, ask this question. Have an experience, but you do not remember that experience. Did it happen? Did it happen? Is there an experience? 100%? Hmm. Everyone agree with uh, anyone? Anyone strongly feel that there that there is not an experience? All right, I'll, I'll let's get one on each side. So, so um, Alice, can you share why you think that there is no experience? Okay, the events would have still happened, but you wouldn't necessarily call it an experience. Now I want to get someone for um, pro. I'm going to go back to Brian. I love that. So Brian's saying that you may have have an experience that impacts your life, impacts your your conscious experience, but it's happening on a subconscious level, and there's no memory of it. So there is an experience. Um, it might be processing trauma, something along those lines, and um, it is real. So I, th I think that this is obviously kind of a semantic question. I mean, like, did it really happen or? Was it an experience? You could kind of frame it in different ways. Whose experience was it is actually the question that I would probably ask here um, that I think gets to the point a little bit more. Um, one, one thing that I would like to invite you all to remember is a time when you remembered a dream. So think about how when you were in bed or whatever during the day, um, you didn't remember the dream it was almost like that experience had never happened. And then suddenly something just clicks. 
like you see a chair and you remember, oh my God, I was playing musical chairs with Albert Einstein and he won. And, and like, those are the kind of things that it, it, it almost is like, um, this whole chain of memory suddenly just emerges. As soon as you get that one hook into the dream, it, it, it opens up the entirety of that space. Um, so it, all of this to say, I believe that everyone dreams. I think that we are all dreaming. We have dreams. They just may not be getting, the, the dreams might be like stray BART trains that are kind of careening off down the 580 and don't get linked back up to the Fremont line. And when you link those trains back up, the whole train gets, you know, it's like, oh, whoa, this train was here the whole time. I had this experience. It's all like a part of you, you know, but um, you have to pull it in in order to bring those memories into the thread of your conscious experience, what you would call the ongoing story of your life, which is defined as a series of memories that you experience and can sort of say, oh, well, yeah, then I was, you know, I was I was at home before this, and then before that I was living in Marin. And then before that I was uh, a kid playing baseball, etc. Like it's a it's a chain of events, and so the idea here, the dream practice, whether or not you're lucid, is to make all of that dream experience a part of that story, a part of the story of your life, because it's happening, it's there, it's something that you have access to, but you just might not be remembering it, and therefore missing a little bit of the value but i still think like brian said that you're getting most of the value of dreaming even when you don't remember it because it is still serving its primary evolutionary function of integrating memories of processing pain of t of, of being a sort of a practice ground where you can train for expect what you're expecting to experience next um and so those are all happening anyway uh okay so so now that I've hyped it up a good bit about the whole memory thing, I think we can talk about dream journal practice, how to actually keep a dream journal and have it be effective. Um, so we're kind of moving into how to dream journal. And actually for this exercise, I am going to need four people, volunteers, who are willing to do something interesting in front of the audience to come up here. So can I get some people? Four, maybe? Yeah, come on up. Just just jump up here. We got one. We got Tomas. We got Dave. And then we got, I, I'm, I think I'm good. So so we got we got our four. All right. So um, one second. Go off to the side, plan it out a little bit. This is going to be fun. <laughs> All right. So uh, while we're thinking about that, um, let's just talk about the actual journal, the journal itself, the very iPhone upon which you spend six hours of your waking life staring into those pixels. Holy shit. It could also be your dream journal. You could also use a physical book. You could use your computer. You could do a recording on your phone ins instead of like a, a written note. Um, I would say do what feels most natural for you and what you can most imagine not being too lazy to do when you wake up at 5 in the morning and you just had a really cool dream, but you're also really sleepy and you kind of want to go back to bed. Um, for me, that's a laptop. I like to pull my laptop over, type it out really quickly, and then throw it away and go back to sleep. Um, but sometimes like a phone works, uh, basically anything. So it needs to be easy to write in. It needs to be near you. So you keep your dream journal with you at all times when you're asleep. And it should be within reach. And so like I sometimes like to do this demo. Um, I'll do it at the end. But basically, uh, you you keep it near you, you set the intention that you will use this journal, this space, to record your dreams. This is the destination. This is like 
that BART train I was talking about earlier, this is the final stop that it's going to. And if that's not there, then it doesn't know where it's going. So that having that journal as the destination for your dreams is extraordinarily important. People sometimes say, I know you guys are ready. I see it. I see it over there. Um, so people sometimes say um, that you don't, that they don't dream. You know, or that how can I write my dream down if I don't even have a dream to begin with? Just try it. Just try it. Just, just get the dream journal, get ready to write it down, and try it. Okay, so then you set the intention that you'll write in it, and then you actually do it. And actually doing it, um, I'll just demo it really quick, but basically it looks like this. So you're sleeping like this. Your dream journal is here. It has to be within one arm's reach. It cannot be that you need to significantly move your body to do this. Um, so you're asleep, sleep, 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 whatever. And then you wake up all of a sudden, and it's like, oh, I would have to write this down. Oh, my God. You reach over. the. F uh, okay, first of all, take a couple of seconds to just marinate that. Like, breathe. Okay, I was, I was in the... Or, or like I'm in the car and before that I'm like playing around with those people and then it was like that happened and it was just kind of going over the dream in your head. And then when you're ready, you grab the dream journal, pull it over, type that out as fast as you can because it's going, it's going, going, gone. And then that's it. You can go back to sleep if you want or you can start your day if you want. Um, so what we're all going to do now is I want you to actually, if you can, get out your phones if you have them with you. Get out your phones. Open up your app, notes, whatever else you like to write stuff in. And we're going to do a little, uh, it, this is where the, the, the people are going to come into play. We're going to do a little demonstration of what this will be like. So I want you to open up notes, and I want you to write down, I will write down my next dream here, colon. This is how I do it. Every time I'm going to do a dream practice night, I write this down. I'm going to dream into these lines. This is where the dream is going to get written down. So you write that down. Now, I want you all to imagine that this is a dream. Okay? This is a dream. Right now. You are in a dream. Now, cue the performance. Okay, now everyone close your eyes. Close your eyes, close your eyes, close your eyes. You just woke up. You're lying in bed. What just happened? Remember it? Remember it? Don't forget what just happened. You were just dreaming something. And then when you're ready, open your eyes and write down the dream you had. Write it down in present tense. This is happening. This is present tense happening. Um, it's a little bit better than past tense. David, um, all volunteers to the front, please. Um, so yeah, just uh, take a couple more seconds to write that down. And then can I get a huge round of applause for these awesome dancers we had up here? <laughs> nice job. You guys crushed it. Way to go. Awesome. Uh, I don't know if everyone knew that, but these people were not trained in squawk dancing. They just came up here. Uh, just on a whim, choreographed that. So anyway. Uh, okay, so that's kind of the dream journal practice. I really wanted to put it into action where you imagine it, you do it. This is what it feels like when you wake up from a dream. Something weird happens, uh, and then you write it down. So, um, so that kind of brings us to the next question, which like when these people were squawking around up here, you might have asked yourself, Am I really dreaming right now? This is getting kind of weird. Um, so how do you know that you are awake right now? Before I tell you how to find that out, let's go back to our discussion groups, and we'll talk for about one to two minutes on how do you know right now that you're awake, or do you not? Go. So Emilo is saying there are just vibes, different sensations between, is that, I don't know if I got your name right there? Emil, sorry, Emil. Oh, okay, so it's actually Emil, but it does say Emil. Anyway, so Emil is saying, 
um, there's just a feeling. It's a different feeling when you're when you're dreaming than when you're awake. Um, I agree with that. I think that that is one way of knowing. There's this, uh, you described it as like it feels like a sort of more vibrant sensory experience when you're awake, whereas when you're dreaming, it's almost like you're in this sort of like weird cocoon. Um, that's true. So sometimes, I mean, dreams can vary a lot more than reality. Um, a couple more, a couple more. Maybe one from over there. Yeah. What's your name? Katie is saying that she thinks that if you're dreaming, you don't feel groggy, and they feel groggy. So um, I hate to break it to you, but actually feeling groggy is a pretty common side effect of being in a dream. Um, a lot of times when you're in the dream, you're kind of in that half awake, half asleep phase. Sometimes you're dreaming that you're tired. It makes sense because you are sleeping when you're dreaming, so that's sort of a very relevant context for your dreaming mind to pick up on that you happen to be groggy or sleepy. Um, cool. All right. So let's do one more right here. Oh, cool. What's your name? Lauren is saying that um, when she dreams, she sometimes is like, in an over-the-shoulder third-person perspective, whereas usually waking life for her is more of like a first-person view, like from the eyes out. Um, and that's that's actually really interesting. A lot of times I think it's true. Dreams can uh, not always be from the perspective of within the body, um, which... Okay, so I think these are all great answers. Um, one thing that I noticed about them, and I'm sure some people also have like the real deal lucid dreaming tips out there, but uh these are not necessarily definitive right i mean it's it's also not something that you could necessarily easily um check while you're awake so like what perspective am i seeing from well kind of it's kind of always feels like it's from my eyes i guess i could ask that while i'm in a dream um but i want to give you some ways to figure out if you're dreaming or awake that are just tried and true very easy to do and will will work for you. Okay. So um, first of all, let's go through the four steps of doing an effective reality check. So this is actually where most people fall off the bandwagon with reality checks. And I see this all the time. I talk to people and I'm saying, hey, can you do the nose check? Really do the nose check? But they just don't want to do it. They, they do it. They, they pinch their nose. They try to breathe through it but the, they, they clearly aren't taking it seriously. What does that mean to take it seriously? It means to assume as a baseline that you're dreaming. Actually, assume that you're dreaming first and then prove to yourself and the world that you're actually not asleep. Um, then, you number two, you say, okay, I am about to do this thing. And when I do this thing, I will get this data and this data will tell me whether I am dreaming or awake right now. And then you do the thing. You do the experiment. And then afterwards, you have to review the results. Did the result of my exper experiment hold up to what I was expecting it to, to prove that I was awake or asleep? It's kind of like when you're in uh, elementary school and you have to do a science project, and not only do you have to write the methods and the results, but then you have to do a conclusion after that. And you might wonder, like, well, why am I doing all of this? It's like, really obvious, like I just proved this thing and now I have to summarize it and conclude. Actually, dream checks are the same way. It's it, The metacognition around the dream check is the part that works. It's not the actual check itself that makes the difference. So let's do some checks. Um, so we can talk about the kind of four ones that I really like. Um, one of words and symbols. There's something about the way that your brain does symbols when you're asleep that's just different from how it works when you're awake and um like when you're looking at text we'll do an exercise on this in a second but when you look at text uh you might read this and say it says fingers and toes but then when you really start to look at the letters when you're dreaming you notice that like wait that's not an s that's a like that's a little pineapple or something and it, it just starts to like fall apart at the seams like there's there's the, the symbols themselves are not stable in dreams, and that applies to numbers, it applies to letters, 
uh, it doesn't apply to the meaning of those things, you know? It's like how you could see a basketball in a dream. You could see the word basket. You could see what you think is the word basketball in a dream. But if you look at it, you'll realize, no, the part of my brain that normally does this whole symbol creation thing is just not on right now. Um, and the next one is the feeling. So kind of like what we were talking about earlier with Emil, um, there's a feeling in a dream that is different. And I think I put this as number two, but really it should be number four because this is actually the one that is more of the advanced practice. It's like once you kind of already gotten used to doing these other reality checks, you eventually get to the point where just the feeling is kind of enough. Like as soon as you're wondering, am I awake or, or asleep? You just tap into the feeling and just boom, you like, you realize because it just feels different. Um, but it's not really good to rely on that. So I don't know, maybe I shouldn't have put it on there. Um, another one is fingers and toes. So why don't we all try this right now? So go ahead and count your fingers. Most of us have five. But if you really count them, you see that you have five. And weirdly, in a dream, that doesn't happen. You don't have five. It's crazy. It's, very, it's, it's surprising. It is, sometimes you do. But it's very frequent that when you really look at the number of fingers you have in a dream, it's a number other than five. Especially if you try to count them. One, two, three. You just start getting all jumbled up. You can't figure out if you're on the pinky or the index anymore. And um, yeah, it's really weird. Uh, so I've done a bunch of experiments with stuff like that to sort of actually test like what is it like in dreams, and this is what I found. It often isn't five. Uh, but now, this is my favorite part, guys. I'm gonna teach you my favorite reality check. It's the one that I've taught lots of people, and it's my favorite, and it's the way that most people who I teach how to get lucid, this is how they get lucid, is off of this reality check. It works, says Kim. So this is called the nose check. And it leverages, the, it leverages two special properties of lucid dreaming, or of dream, the dream state. One is that you're paralyzed, so your body can't move in the physical world. But the second is that even though your body is paralyzed, your breath is not. So if you breathe in in a dream, you breathe in in the real world. They're corresponded. Your breath is always your breath. You keep it with you in every level of the astral planes. So here's how that works. Uh, let's all try this right now. So I'm going to go back to here because fundamentals. So first of all, let's assume that we're dreaming. Easy enough. Maybe I'm dreaming right now. I, I don't know. Why am I standing in front of so many people? This is kind of weird. <laughs> now here's what I'm going to do. And please join me in this. I am about to squeeze my nose very tightly, my index finger and thumb. When I do that, I'm going to try to breathe through it. And if I can breathe through it, to me, that'll be a sign that I am, in fact, dreaming and that that's the explanation of why I'm in front of this crowd of people, not Kim's amazing organizing. So let's try it right now. So pinch your nose and try to breathe through it. And you, you probably, maybe you can't. But then afterwards, you look at the results. Okay, I couldn't breathe through it. So um, I think that means I'm awake. Actually, I feel like I was kind of distracted when I just did that one. So I'm just going to do it again. And I, I usually do it like two or three times. So that's it. And when you do this in a dream, you will feel the air rushing into your nose, and it'll be a clear sign that you're, in fact, dreaming. So let's practice that. Um, what I mean is, I don't just want us to practice the version where we conclude that we are awake. Because I think if we only practice concluding that we are awake, then when we're dreaming, we may also just go with those well-trodden neural pathways and conclude that we are awake. So this time, we're going to conclude that we're dreaming. And this is how we're going to do it. But after you conclude that you're dreaming, everybody, please stay seated. Don't start doing crazy things. <laughs> um, so um, here's how it's going to work. We're going to do the exact same check as last time, 
but just trick yourself out of it a little bit when you pinch your nose instead of pinching it all the way down just give yourself a little bit of space for air so let's try it again wow we're all dreaming now that's pretty cool uh, i'm gonna try to fly <laughs> okay what that feels like when you sort of halfway pinch your nose is actually what it feels like in a dream. I don't know why this is, but it doesn't just feel like taking a full breath of air through a completely uncovered nose in a dream. It, maybe it's because I have like sleep apnea or something. It feels more like you're kind of halfway pinching your nose shut and then breathing through it. That's what it'll feel like when you get lucid. So that's how you do that. Um, and then... I'd also like to do a little exercise around text trick. So I went to a retreat with Stephen LaBerge, Dr. Dr. Stephen LaBerge, who is a well-known lucid dreaming scientist. He kind of just scientifically proved that lucid dreaming exists. Um, just a really knowledgeable person in the field. And so for him, uh, he doesn't actually like the nose check for whatever reason. Um, he really prefers the text trick. Um, and so we're going to also do it, spend a little bit of time talking about the text trick. So please take a look at this text. Read those words and internalize what they say, the meaning. And then close your eyes or look away, or look away from the words and look back at them and ask yourself, does it still say the same thing? Does it still say the same thing? And it, it maybe it does. So you can conclude that you're awake. But let's try this again. So take a look at this text this time. And then look away for a second. And now look back at it. Look a little bit more closely at what it says. Does it still say what you thought it was going to say? Now try it because you might not be sure. Look away again. And now look at it again. Does it still say what it said before? Really, it's not just about whether the letters look weird. It's about whether they are letters at all or if they've transformed into something completely different. This is as best as I could do using some simple tools of creating a non-animated version of what text in dreams sometimes turns into. Um, I also have created an app that does an animated version of this that I think is actually a little bit more accurate to what dream text looks like. So that pretty much covers it. Oh, there's one more. Um, technology doesn't really work well in dreams. So here's a good idea. Whenever your phone doesn't work, do a reality check. Um, it's a really common dream sign to be, tr especially trying to take a picture. Like when I first started using Snapchat, um, I was constantly trying to snap my dreams because I would see something really cool and I wanted the rest of my social following to know about it. And, um, and then I would get out my phone and I would be really excited to like take this like humpback whale or something and just like, God damn it, the, the like photo button doesn't work or something. And so this is a really common one that you can uh, pick up on and then just go ahead and just try to do a reality check. Um, so what I, before, I, before that, we are going to have just, just questions in just a second. But before I um, move on from this, the practice around reality checks is to habituate them into your everyday life. So either you just tell yourself, I'm going to do this, this nose check like a few times a day, or you tether it to a particular thing, like when my phone doesn't work, I would do a nose check. When I see a famous person, I'll do a nose check. Every time I get in a car, I will do a nose check, a reality check, whatever reality check you want to do. And so you connect something, and then that thing happens in a dream, and boom, you're lucid. It's that simple. That's this, this practice sometimes works that way. Um, all right, uh, what was the question? Okay, so I'm going to talk more about the app later. Yeah, and then Emil.
Okay, so Emil has asked an advanced question, which is how to stay lucid once you get lucid. And the answer is, you do this. I know this seems weird, but that is one way. You spin around in a circle, and there's something about the physicality of doing that with your body, well, dream body, I guess, that makes it more likely that you'll stay in the dream. Um, and that, but, but before you even do that, really the, the most important technique is just to breathe. It's basically like there's this natural instinct to be like, oh my God, I'm lucid. Yes. Um, no, just, just chill out, breathe, relax. It's kind of like a meditation. And wait, because probably the dream that you're in is going to collapse. And you're going to have to wait till the next dream starts to get really on the, the dream train. There's two ways. So one is to just habituate it, like I'm talking about. Like you just bring it into a habitual practice for yourself. And then that way, it's sort of like whatever I'm habitually doing during the day, I start to habitually do during my dreams. The other way is, is uh, I think, kind of what you're asking about. You can actually plant the seed in your mind of what, during the day you say, Later on tonight, when I am dreaming, I will do a dream check. In the same way that you might um, suggest to yourself, next time that I am at the grocery store, I will buy more toilet paper. Uh, and then you obviously forget to and come home and have to find that one roll that's in the back. Um, but it's the same idea. You plan an idea that when I am later tonight asleep, I will do a dream check. And it can be powerful enough that you actually will execute that check when you get into the dream. Um, this is a technique that they talked about a lot at the retreat I was at with Dr. LeBerge. They uh, believe in it a lot. N mnemonic induced lucid dreaming, mild. So you tell yourself you will do a dream check. OK, so let's keep going here. So there's only one more component to the how of lucid dreaming. We've talked about the dream journal and the reality checks. And the truth is a lot of, a lot of literature, a lot of like lucid dreaming um, content is sort of, this is the focus. If you just do these two things, you might lucid dream, you might not. But if you do this last part, actually doing it, then you actually will lucid dream. And uh, let me explain how that actu actually works. So it's a practice that was developed by Dr. LaBerge and his colleagues called Wake Back to Bed. And in this technique, you sleep for about four to five hours. And I will talk about the, sleeps, the sleep cycles and phases. We're going to go all over that just in a moment. But you sleep for about four to five hours, and then you wake up. You wake up, and you get up. You really get up. It's not just roll over in bed, like, OK, I woke up at four. Now what? No, you really wake up. You seize the moment. You get out of bed. And you spend about 30 minutes sort of doing whatever makes you feel awake. It could be walking around. It could be working. It could be talking to a friend if you have any friends who live in New Zealand. Um, <laughs> something like that. And then uh, after that, you go back into bed and you start the waiting game. Because this isn't just going to be falling asleep in the way that you fall asleep when you fall asleep when you're sleepy. This is like you woke up in the middle of the night. You got all jazzed up. And now you're back in bed and you don't feel sleepy anymore. And if that's how you feel, then that means you're doing it right. You're doing it right if you get back in bed and you don't feel sleepy. You're laying there. You're saying, why did Evan tell me to do this? I can't fall back asleep. It might even take an hour. You know, a lot. Sometimes, like this is the part where you just feel like I'm wasting my life. Like lucid dreaming is not worth it. Um, so, uh, yes. So you wait. You be patient. You breathe. You breathe, and then you start to notice as you get those little encroachments into your consciousness that might just feel like, instead of you thinking that thought, that thought just sort of thought its way into your brain. And then that starts to turn into that image just starts to play in your head. That song just starts to, and then all of a sudden it's, wait, I was just walking down the street with my friend. That's how the transition into dreams is. It starts off as takeover of the thought, and then it, it, it builds from that into a complete takeover of your conscious experience. And we are going to have questions in just a second. Um, so you wait, you wait, you flip, and then in this practice, you go straight into a lucid dream, basically. You don't even have a really much sleep before that. You're just, you're just directly into a lucid dream. and. Even though this is considered an advanced practice, I actually consider this the easiest way to get lucid because it's a very powerful technique that actually works. 
Um, but it is it is also important that you have the fundamentals because if you don't know how to do a dream check, you might get into the dream and then just feel like sort of, oh, what? Like, I can't do a nose check, so I just don't know. Um, so yeah, that's we can talk more about this, but basically those are the three things. So if you come out of here remembering only three things, they would be um, dream journal, reality checks, and then this thing, wake back to bed. So I've this is the end basically of the how to lucid dream part of this talk. I'm gonna get more into the details later, but I'm gonna take a second here. I wanna pause and I wanna see if people have questions about how to um, lucid dream. And then also, uh, Kim, if you could let me know how we're doing on time. I'm um, just kind of curious to check in on time. Um, OK, so let's start here with Alice. What's up? Do you just set an alarm? Yes, that's how you, would, that's how you do it. That's as simple as that. Um, uh, green dress. So Tatiana is asking basically where are these words going to be that you're going to be using. It, it might be that you, um, so first of all, I think there's usually something that's readable in most scenes. And that tends to hold true in dreams as well. Like if you look around to try to find something you can read, usually you can. Um, the other way of thinking about it is when you see something that could be words or written, that's the trigger to try that specific check. Um, yes. Can you can you explain what you mean by that? Yeah. So she is asking about the nose check, whether you're actually doing it physically or if you're doing it only in the dream body. So basically, you would do it physically for as long as you could, and then when you do it in the dream body is when it would become a positive, like, oh, I am dreaming. Yeah. So it is it is in the dream body. Like, the, the successful one is happening in the dream body. You're not just, like, animating. Um, and then, yeah, Karen. So Karen's asking, um, why would you do a reality check? I already know when I'm dreaming. Well, f maybe you already are lucid dreaming all the time. And actually, for you, these practices may not be necessary. But um, if you're at that level, then it's more about how you control the dream from there or what you want to do with the dream than just to recognize that you're dreaming. But for most people, I think it's, it is, it's important to have this. Yeah. So let's, let's do a couple more questions. How about at the back over here? So we have a question about technology-induced dream checks while you're in a dream. And I can tell you all about them. I can tell you all about them. I can. And I will. But I will get to that. There's a whole section on that later. Yeah. Um, let's go back, and then we'll come up. Yeah. So someone said, I never remember what I dream about. How can I remember more? So OK. So I gave you the tip of writing it down, but I'll give you one more trick on how to remember your dreams. Let's say you wake up and you're just like completely drawing a blank. Like, I don't think I dreamed at all. Like, I mustn't have. And here are a couple of things you can do to try to pull that memory back. Number one, how do you feel? How do you feel when you wake up and where did that feeling come from? A lot of times the only thing that's left over from a dream is not an image, it's not a plot line. It's just a lingering feeling. Like, oh, there was that, mm, that something. But if you start with that, <laughs> if you start with that, you can, you can follow that. You can think, where did that come from? It's good to just stay there in bed and with your eyes closed and breathe a little. Sometimes another technique that can work is if you stay there in bed breathing, 
to the point where you actually start to fall asleep again. Uh, in that little moment of almost falling asleep again, a lot of times you'll get a flash of memories of the dream that you had before. And it can even be confusing. You'll be like, wait, did I just dream like that all just now? Or, or was it the dream that I had before? But, but being closer to the dream state allows you to get more memories back. And then the last one is, and actually I have, I have more of these tips. So another one is just, <laughs> this is the most ridiculous thing I learned at this retreat. I don't know if this would actually work, but I encourage you to try it. Um, just ask yourself completely random things. Was this in my dream? <laughs> so like, let's say, did I dream about cars? Did I dream about light bulbs? Did I dream about friends? Like a list of random things. Apparently that can work for a lot of people. You just, uh, at some point on that list of like common things, you're like, oh, I did dream about whatever, bla basketball, because I play basketball a lot. And it's sort of like a way to, to trigger some memories. Um, all right, cool. So then uh, first here, and then we'll go blue shirt, and then I think that might be it, yeah. Yeah. Certainly. So I know... So, I, so we're asking about whether um, whether we need to pull out our blue blocking sunglasses during the 30 minute wake back to bed sleep interaction interruption. You know, it's an interesting question because I actually think that maybe it's productive to have the blue light there because the goal in that time is to get as awake as possible. It's to make it so that you're, it's kind of the opposite of what sleep hygiene is asking for, which is for you to try to dim everything down, mellow out. We're trying to do the opposite during these 30 minutes. We're trying to get riled up, have a stressful conversation, like deal with some shit that we didn't want to do the other day, whatever it is. And then, and then that wakes you up. So the goal is to get completely awake. Um, you know, but obviously like it's always a little unpleasant to look at those lights, but yeah. And um, I hope that answers your question. I would say you could choose yourself, but the point is to get as awake as possible. And did you still want to ask something, Jay? So Jay is experiencing what sounds like some extreme uh, choking of him. <laughs> and I, I, I don't know what to tell you because I think that, so some people are saying sleep apnea. I'm not sure if it, it could be that. It could also just be that um, the feeling of falling asleep, that feeling of that transition from waking to sleep can be pretty weird. Um, it can be very uncomfortable. And this is actually one of the big warnings Warning, warning, warning. If you do decide to take the galantamine, it's highly likely that you might experience some unpleasant side effects associated with the transitional phase in between awake and asleep. Extreme noise, a sensation of that you're flying through the air, a feeling of maybe a demon being sitting next to you or on you or choking you. It could all be a part of the experience. And I don't have a specific prescription for that, but um, I hope that it isn't always like that for you. I'm sorry. Uh, and I'm going to, Jakarta? Jakara, sorry. Thank you, Jakara. Sorry, I got your name wrong. Um, so the question is, is the intention that you bring to lucid dreaming similar to that that you would bring to a psychedelic experience or other types of meditative uh, states? And I think that it is both similar and different in that um, the power of the dream technology to look within the self and experience things, it actually allows for a more... Um, 
it really allows for a, a much more literal experience. So instead of instead of uh, asking like you know I want to sort of reflect on this trauma that I experienced or something I want to unpack it, you could intend to no I want to actually ask the person who that was associated with a specific pointed question about it and unpack it. And so you get to be a little bit more specific in what you're asking for. And yeah, otherwise I would say it is, it is, it is a similar process of intention setting. You just might want to set a different type of intention. And I, I know that a lot of people have more questions, but we're going to have to uh, keep going. We will have another Q&A at the end. This was just the how to lucid dream Q&A that I wanted to make sure we got some of those out of the way. Thank you. Yeah. OK. All right, so let's, I know there's some stuff, but I just want to keep this going. So um, all right, so let's look at this. This is called a hypnogram. I just think that's a cool word. Um, it's also a cool graph. And if you haven't seen one of these or you've forgotten, because I oftentimes like I, I learned this, and then I sort of forget it a little bit. Um, but basically, this is the hypnogram. And what it shows is what it's like for you over the course of a sleep night, what you experience, the different phases of sleep. Um, and I can tell you a little bit about each of these. And it's interesting to sort of like experience each of these directly as well um, through lucid dreaming. But you basically go from awake and then your first, so you see how these cycles. So your first few cycles of the night, three cycles really, are when you're getting a lot of N3 as in non-REM stage three. And it used to be also like stage four was like another one that they would carve out here. But I guess, I don't know if maybe that's fallen out of fashion or something. Um, but yeah, so you have the NREM stage three. And this is really where you're in a, it's slow wave sleep, deep, um, deep cycle uh, sleep with the, the, you're very unconscious. Um, your human growth hormone, you're growing and you're just resting. It's like where your physical body just rests. Uh, and then there's NREM stage two. NREM stage two is uh, known to most sleep scientists as the kind of sleep that you get when you take sleep drugs. It's not deep sleep. It's not REM. You can have dreams, but they're not as crazy as the ones you have in REM. And you can get rest, but not as deep of rest as you get in NREM three. So stage two sleep is, is fine. It's not accomplishing a lot of the sort of more process, processing goals that we had for our sleep. So you don't really want to get more stage two sleep. And that's probably what's happening if like you're drinking yourself to sleep or taking an Ambien, maybe cannabis, whatever it is that's helping you get to sleep. Might be helping you fall asleep, but it might not be helping you get more stage three sleep or REM. It's just N2, which is not the best. Okay, and then we get to the fun part of the night, this part of the night. So this is when you've kind of burned through that low stage of uh, you've had enough deep sleep, and so your body's kind of recuperating, but your brain still gets to do this final last act of hallucinating whatever the hell it wants for like two hours, which is so crazy that this happens to us every single night. And it's, and it's happening across the chunk of times, mostly cycle three, four, and five. And that's why usually... Let's say that you did lucid dreaming practice, really knocked it out. You'd experience more than likely two or three really vivid dreams, uh, which overall take about maybe like this one's looking like it's like 20, 30 minutes, and this is getting up to like half an hour. And then the, the really long one, the last one, it can, can actually be over an hour uh, in the state cycle five. And so what we're really trying to do with lucid dreaming with his wake back to bed is after this is all done, we're waking up right here. We're waking up after cycle three. And so we still have cycle four and five in the chamber ready to go. Our body wants it. It wants to, to have four and five, but we've deprived it of that. And instead we're sneaking in this like weird little chunk of wakefulness right here. And so what that often does is it replaces the beginning of cycle four and then when you end up falling back asleep, you go straight into REM instead of going through the other phases of sleep, which can be a lot harder to maintain lucidity through because they're low in content. Like 
it's hard to remember that you're dreaming when your entire dream is just like darkness and a mm, like humming sound. Like <laughs> that's not really like it's just sort of like okay, like what's going on here? And that's kind of what it feels like to be in some of these other stages of sleep. They just don't feel the same as REM. And REM is where you get these really exciting dreams, um, the vivid hallucinations, the feeling of meeting other people. Uh, and so basically, the optimal thing is to remember your REM cycles and also to be lucid for your REM cycles. Um, it's also interesting to note that there are these little like pops up into wakefulness that you notice, and that's actually really common. We're waking up a lot more times in the night we may not realize because uh, you wake up and then you kind of go straight back to sleep with no memory of the fact that you waked up, woke up. Um, sorry, uh, but uh, if you get into a sleep lab that consistently shows that there is a lot of these like little wake up pops happening. So um, yes, yeah, so we're just gonna keep going here. Um, so basically, um, the um, the rest of the science here. I want to just kind of like this is just like cool shit I learned when I was out there, and I want to share it. So first of all, Dr. LeBurge proved that lucid dreaming. To most of the scientific community, not this is still not 100% accepted research, but most people accept that this study proved that lucid dreaming existed. And how they did that, they leveraged the fact that um, other than your breath, the one other thing that you have active control over while you were dreaming is your eyes. And it's interesting because, you know, rapid eye movement sleep, or you might even think of it as random eye movement sleep, the eyes are kind of just going all over the place. They're not necessarily charting out a path like they would in, uh, even if you thought that they were si simulating a dream. It turns out that while you're dreaming, your eyes move randomly until you exert conscious control over them through a dream that specifically dictates a certain type of eye movement. For example, like following as an action's happening. Or if you're lucid and you're saying, oh, I'm going to look back and forth now. When that happens, your actual physical eyes in the real world actually move in the same way. And it's this, it, if it weren't for this, it would be super hard to prove lucid dreaming. Um, but what they, what LeBerge et al. did was they asked their subjects to do a signature eye movement, left, right, left, right, when they realized that they were dreaming from within the dream. And so they had people rigged up to the EOG sensors and they actually signaled from within a dream back to the waking world, hey guys, I'm in here, I'm lucid, look at me. Um, so I think that's pretty cool. Um, that there's these, there's these two parts of, of our being that actually through the dream and through waking are connected, breathing and our eye movements. Um, and I, I really think there's a lot of potential with breathing and it's sort of one that hasn't been very explored but it's sort of if you do breath work while you're in a dream, what are the possibilities of that? Um, because you actually will be doing that breath work. Um, so let's talk about time and sex, two things that everyone wants more of. Just kidding. Um, okay, so time and dreams. Interesting study that was done on the back of this was, well, okay, actually, that's, that's what this is a graphic of. Now that we have people signaling from within a dream, we've all heard these accounts of, oh, when I was dreaming, and I was dreaming for a month, and then I woke up, and it was like only half an hour. Um, so how does that happen? Well, it turns out if you actually ask somebody in a dream to estimate 10 seconds or count to 10, the amount of time that it takes them to do that is actually very similar to that in which it takes in the waking world. So at least in a lucid dream, it seems time progresses somewhat to the same march that it does when we're awake. But um, that doesn't mean that sometimes you experientially might it feel like more time. Like if you... Uh, graduate from school, get married, die, are reborn, all within one dream, you'll probably wake up feeling like you had more than a 20-minute dream because of the plot. It's not necessarily because you actually experienced more time. Um, but it, it, this is debatable, right? It's a very subjective question. Um, and then the other question was about sex. So um, lucid dreaming sex, probably something that most people might try if they're lucid. I don't know. I definitely did it a lot. Um, and there's a couple of interesting insights about uh, dream sex. One is that dream sex is not real sex. Um, it's not as good as real sex because in real sex, your partner never transforms into a small hairless gnome.
Anyway, so. Um, but also, the real data on this is that when you have sex in dreams, on average, it actually takes people only about 13 to 15 seconds to orgasm. Um, and so they did some experiments where they measured it. And it is interesting that your physical body does experience some of the symptoms of an orgasm um, while you're in dream sex. Uh, and yet it only takes 15 seconds. So it's also like, even if it was as good as real sex, which it's not, it's only 15 seconds. So my, my overall takeaway is give it a shot, but pursuing sex in dreams is not what I would think of as the best use of your time in the lucid state, um, even though it might be a tempting one. And then uh, galantamine. So I have some galantamine, and it does make me feel like a drug dealer, but um, earlier today I was at home, and I was packing up all these little baggies of pills for you all to take home, and... Um, the story about how they discovered galantamine is actually really interesting, um, or discovered that it works for lucid dreaming. So Dr. LaBerge was doing a, uh, something in which they had discovered that right before people get lucid, so they were looking at the, um, the cortical activation levels like just before this, so before people signaled like, hey, hey, I'm in here, and they saw that there was an increase in cortical activation of people who were about to get lucid. And that type, I'm not, I don't know the exact science behind this, but that type of activation was also associated with what you saw when people were on galantamine. And so they decided to try giving people galantamine to activate this sort of, whatever it is, this is S, that then causes you to get lucid. And it turned out it really, really, really works. They're working on publishing a study soon that's gonna just, I was par taking part in it but I can show, tell you right now that galantamine works. It makes you lucid dream. If everything else that I tell you here doesn't work, if you try galantamine a couple of times, it will work. It is very effective. Um, but it also has more side effects. So I don't actually use galantamine a lot, but I do use it occasionally. And I can tell you a little bit more about it in a moment. Um, but for now, I think we might just um, start handing it out. So if you, I, I don't know if... Yeah, who Kim is going to help with this. So please just take one of these packs. Each pack has two in it, and the two are enough for either one like very powerful dose, or you can take it as two individual not so powerful doses. If you take them together, you'll feel it. Um, I'm going to skip through here. Spirituality. Pff, just kidding. Uh, sorry, I'm kind of like, it's a lot of content. OK, so there is this thing called Tibetan dream yoga. How is it different from lucid dreaming? It's different because the Tibetan version of lucid dreaming is not as fun as lucid dreaming because they don't want you to dream. There is actually a goal of no dreaming. Instead, you're just supposed to bask in what feels like a clear light. And the goal, really, is to um, bring forth a light, uh, a symbol, like a light symbol, and bring it into, into your dream and carry it with you throughout the dream so that when you wake up, you still have that awareness of that light. And you had it all night. There, the idea is that actually bringing that into deep sleep is a very powerful technique that simulates dying. So if you can go into deep sleep while still preserving some awareness of something and bring it back with you, it's sort of like a little re dress rehearsal for going to death and then coming back out with or in with some awareness so that you're, go you're going in with a little, a little light to light your way. And I also learned about a bunch of other stuff. Yoga Nidra, Guru Yoga, where you merge with your master while you're dreaming. Uh, mantra Yoga, if you do mantras, if you actually chant in a dream, that can be a very powerful. So it's combined yoga and meditation practices with lucid dreaming, and you get very transcendental, powerful experiences. Um, but for me, like it really all comes down to this one thing, which is seeing this true nature of self. And this is kind of approximately where I'm going to wrap things up. but. Um, philosophically, so I, I was left with this quote from LeBerge while I was there, which is, we do not experience the physical world. Um, this is not something that I believed very strongly. I didn't have a concrete understanding of what this meant until I started doing a lot of lucid dreaming. Doing lucid dreaming showed me that my brain is creating a very rich environment 
and that it didn't need physical data to paint that picture. And so now, when I look at the physical world, instead of feeling like I'm directly experiencing it, well, I still feel that way, but I'm, but I'm not. It's more that my brain is painting a very nice picture of something that it sees. My mind is creating a simulation of a physical world that I believe is out there, but it's, it's lucid dreaming that allows you to have this realization and embody it because you can be in the dream seeing something that looks so real, like this wall, that you just can't imagine that it's not actually there. And then when you wake up and you look at that same wall, it's like, oh, well, I could just do that in a dream. So like, your brain is creating your entire reality all the time anyway. I hope that makes sense. I think this is kind of the, um, the biggest thing I get out of it. And, and when you're actually experiencing it in a dream, it's very powerful. You get into a sort of metacognitive state of, I am aware that I'm experiencing a self-created reality. Um, even though we always are, actually. But it's very difficult to break the illusion that we're experiencing something external. So that's, so that's pretty much the end of my talk, except this last little bit where I'm going to talk to you about what I'm doing because I quit my job and I'm full-time dreaming now and I'm building apps and I'm a developer. And I'm doing it. Yeah. Thank you for your support. Okay. So, um, so first of all, let's talk about these dream headsets that are out there. Okay. So uh, there's devices in the marketplace right now that will tr promise to get you lucid. And they do flash lights in your eyes. It's sometimes possible that these lights get incorporated into a dream and they might work as a trigger to, to ask yourself if you're lucid. Um, so I think that, the, that they are fine. I'm personally not a huge believer in that technology because I think that we all already have phones and we might as well try to find a way to use the tech that we already have instead of introducing another piece of junk into our lives that we can still lucid dream off of it. Um, so I started at a company called Dream Labs um, and uh, I built a product called dreamingyourawake.com, which is a super simple, but it's an app that you can go to on your phone that essentially provides reality checks on your phone. And the reality checks sometimes uh, turn out to be like look like it's real, and sometimes they look like you're dreaming. So it, the idea is to actually make you question whether you're dreaming or not, because sometimes you use that website and it won't look real. Um, so yeah, but what have I really been working on for the past six months or so? Um, this app called Dreamcatcher. It's 90% magic and only 10% technology. Um, but what it does is it basically encapsulates a lot of these learnings and experiences, the kind of like this talk that I've been giving to you, and it distributes it across two weeks over these little five-minute lessons that you do. And it, it gives you that instruction across time that will allow you to actually take the space and time to get yourself lucid uh, over two weeks. And there's also some secret sauce to it. And the secret sauce of this is this thing called a phone being able to vibrate. So basically the way it works is that you, you hold the phone, perhaps you put it on your chest, whatever is easy for you, and you tap it. And every time you tap it, it vibrates. And that's a sign that you're awake. If you're tapping the phone and it's vibrating, it means you're awake. And the phone sometimes vibrates. And when the phone vibrates, it's asking you, are you awake? Can you check? Can you tap me? Can you confirm that you're awake? And this happens while you're falling asleep. So as you're falling asleep, you might feel the vibration. While you're asleep, you might also feel the vibration. It's possible to feel vibrations and hear sounds while you're asleep. So you feel the vibration while you're asleep. You try to tap the phone. It doesn't vibrate that's how you know you're lucid. And so that's kind of how I've tried to build the whole the whole tech stack of like um, reality checking and, and being triggered to do a reality check all into a phone. And so that's kind of like at the end of the, the Dreamcatcher app, you have that. Um, so that is kind of where we get to the promotional part. If you do want to sign up um, for the beta test of that app, it's at dreamlabs.tech, and you can just follow the happy path, the main call to action on the front page, and it um, will allow you to sign up for the beta. So um, 
It'd be awesome if you guys do that. It's completely not something I'm trying to make money off of, and I'm not going to spam your inboxes. I just want to get more people lucid. So um, yeah, so check out dreamlabs.tech. Check out the, the Dream Capture page. And um, finally, this is it. So I've been passing out galantamine. By accepting the galantamine, you have agreed not to hold me or consciousness hacking accountable for any result resulting disease, injury, or psychological discomfort. Um, I want to be clear about the side effects of galantamine. It has side effects. It might make your stomach feel uncomfortable, especially if you take both of them. Um, it's, it has been very much proven to be safe. It's taken at 3x the dose that we will be taking it as a daily medication for um, Alzheimer's patients in China. That's the main use for it. Um, they take 24 milligrams, and what you're holding is 8 milligrams. So it is definitely not, probably not, dangerous. <laughs> but that being said, I don't know. I'm not the FDA. I'm just giving you what I know works and is not illegal. And um, it, uh, it, it, there's two pills in the bag. If you take one of them, you'll be basically having a slightly modified experience from regular falling asleep. If you take both of them, you will have a very modified experience. You'll be very likely to lucid dream. It would be great to set an intention. And um, you should do it when you. <laughs> no, 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 no. Please, please. You should do it when you first wake up. So when you wake up at the 5 in the morning, you pop the pill, and then you wait for three hours ish, and then you go back to sleep. That's how it works. Oh, but what I was gonna. Oh, you. So you sleep for you sleep for four to five hours. You wake up, you take this, then you stay awake for thirty minutes, telling yourself, "I'm gonna lose a dream when I go back to bed." Get your dream journal ready. Get ready. Set your intention because it's probably gonna happen, and then you go back to sleep, and you actually lose a dream, um, and wake up and write it down. That's how it works. Uh, you take the pill as soon as you wake up, and. Um, it's really important, especially if you're taking eight milligrams, which is two pills, to really be sleepy enough to go back to sleep. Because this is a mild stimulant. So when you take it, if if you get if you let it get too digested into your system or you're like too not sleepy, like the biggest risk is that you won't fall asleep at all afterwards. It's not that you won't lose a dream, as crazy as that is. It's more likely that you will lose a dream, but less likely that you will be able to fall asleep. So make sure that you're not cheating on the four, to, like maybe even like head towards like three and a half or four hours of sleep, just to make sure that you have that sleepiness in the in the tank. Um, okay, and then if if people want to do this together, like actually, I like to do this as a group. So when I teach people to lucid dream outside of a big group like this, what I usually do is I'll meet up with them at five in the morning. And we'll talk about lucid dreaming for 20 to 30 minutes before going back to bed. And then when we wake up, and this is what I did with Kim. This is the thing that worked. So then when you wake up, we also share our dreams. So it becomes a sort of fully inclusive experience uh, at 5 in the morning. And there's some solidarity. And talking to other people is a great way to get yourself into that, I'm awake, I'm in here, I'm, I'm not going to easily fall back asleep. So what I'm offering, also on my website, if for this one, you have to, if you're on your phone, click on the hamburger menu, and then it's the dream call to action there. Um, you can sign up for a 5 a.m. meeting with me and other people in this room where we'll meet on Skype or G Google Hangouts or something like that, and we'll do it. We'll all take the galantamine together. We'll go back to sleep, and then we'll share. You, don't, just, you can also do it without the galantamine. We'll share our experiences afterwards. So I have one scheduled for tonight, 5 a.m. If you just like really love this talk and you're like, yep, I'm ready to do it. I want to get lucid tonight. Meet me at 5 in the morning. Sign up for the thing. And we'll be, we'll be doing that. And then um, Saturday night, so like Sunday morning, Saturday night this weekend, and then another pair like that, or sorry, not another pair, another one like that on the following Wednesday night, Thursday morning of the week after that. Um, so yeah, we're about to end it for questions, but um, that is pretty much it. Um, 
check out the website if you haven't already and um, sign up for something or leave your contact for the beta because it'll make me happy. And yeah, thank you guys so much. I really appreciate your audience. <laughs>